Hello there, short friends. This is going to be a rambly video about Shirasaya. It's a sword log vlog blog type thing, so if you don't want to listen, I wouldn't. But I'm going to talk a little bit about Shirasaya. I'm going to talk a little bit about what I know. I'm going to show some examples, uh, but really it's pretty informal. There is a lesson, I guess, to be learned or something I can share that I learned along the way as it relates to Shirasaya, but that's what I'm going to talk about. So if you're not interested, don't, don't watch or go to the next video now. So what I want to show you is uh, this sword. This is a Shin Sakudo from Kamunjo. I had this in a video not too long ago and now it's in Shirasaya. Uh, wasn't quite sure if it was going to go uh, be a full mounted sword similar to the ones that are back there that's a you know a full mounted or a, got a full set of Koshrai on it. Uh, this is Shirasaya instead. Now Shirasaya if you're not familiar is what people call this this type of look this wooden octagonal shaped uh, scabbard and its intention is not necessarily functional it is practical and functional for its intended use but it's it's meant to be a long-term storage scabbard or a storage scabbard now exactly why that is I don't I don't know I can't tell you why a blade in one of these type of looking mounts is not as good for long-term storage as one in these uh, these aren't generally lacquered and if I think of hip you know Japan you know feudal Japan in the you know, hundreds of years ago, it's a humid place, you know, dry environments probably were tough to find. I don't know if the, the lacquer in that made moisture stick to the blade more. I, I couldn't tell you from a scientific perspective actually why it was better. But if you know, I'd appreciate uh, it in the, in the link below if you can explain why, why it was better for long-term storage. Uh, sometimes on historic or nice pieces, you'll see some writing on the, on the Shirasaya that tells you, you know, what, what the blade is, why it's special uh, amongst other bits of, of stuff. This one doesn't have any of that. It's just a plain, plain looking Shirasaya. And uh, it's, it's also quite, quite large as it is, but very often Shirasaya, or at least in my experience, they, they are often quite a bit larger than the blade. So this one is actually small for a Shirasaya. And the interesting bit that came up as a, as a point of learning while doing this is this blade is, is a, as I may have mentioned, not mine. I, I'm kind of playing this awkward tradey middleman in the, in this particular project here and it's going to go back to its owner in just a minute but the owner was thinking about having the blade or a shirasai made uh, that could be used as a core or a base to later mount it so the sword could look like that uh, and this one didn't really work that way because if it if it was any bigger than it is it'd be absolutely silly uh, it's already you know on, on the very large side uh, but there's really not a lot of meat on the bone for uh, the sword to be mounted up later, you know, maybe that's enough for some folks to work with, uh, but it's it's tough to say exactly. And basically, the the mounter said, you know, hey, if I make it any bigger, it's going to be kind of weird. Uh, I can make it cylindrical so that it's the core of a of a saya, but then, you know, it's not really a, a you know the same type of traditional uh, look of a sheer saya, and it'll it'll be ready, but it won't be as you know. It won't have the same type of refined look, I suppose. Uh, or I could make it a, you know, a, a standard Shirasaya, but then you might not have enough meat left on the bone to later use this as a suka core, uh, and this as a core for your saya to sand down and paint. Uh, the other thing that I would say you'd want to note, and something I've come across in projects from time to time, is if you have a blade in Shirasaya, I would not assume that the person you're going to have working on the sword, if you are like me and send the products off to you know, get finished by somebody that knows what they're doing. If you are the person that knows what you're doing, then you can take your own chances or disregard what I'm saying. But uh, some of the people that work on these for a living don't like using other people's parts, right? Somebody else made this core and this saya, and they don't know how they carved it out or if it's going to be functional. They don't want to write their name on it uh, because they don't know how it's made. And if it cracks or breaks or isn't structurally sound or if you know somebody carved a little too deep in here so when they sand it down to give it a nice profile for uh, the the oval shape that it needs to be you know there's a hole in it or something that they have to worry about and you know start over and lose a bunch of time so quite often there are folks that don't want to use you know these as a base to do their work they'd rather just you know start start from scratch so they know what they're working with and that's something that I didn't necessarily know it's not always a constant either my point is really just make sure if you're operating under the assumption that you can send somebody this, save money, and they can use it as a core, be sure that you address that point with them because it's not a, a 
guaranteed thing. They may not want to work with it at all, or maybe they won't want to work with a handle, but they'll work with a base or vice versa. I don't really know. Maybe they'll try it, and if it doesn't work, they, I, I don't know. The point is, be sure you talk about it if you're having somebody do that work. The other note is, I talk to a lot of people that say, you know, I bought a bear blade, and it's sitting on a shelf or in a safe or something like that, and I'm saving up money to get all of this, that, and the other made. Uh, you know, but I, I put it in a safe or something like that because I don't want to leave it out. I've got kids, or uh, it, it could rust, you know, something like that. But getting something like this made is, is you know, it depends. Sometimes it's under 400 bucks. Uh, sometimes it can be more, depending on how many uh, frills you put on it. Frills could be, you know, you could have uh, horn parts put around the Makugiana or the where the Makugi goes or where the Fuchi and Koiguchi are here or uh, you could have a, a few things done to bling it up if you will and still have it be consistent with the Shirasaya. But uh, the point is that it's you know makes for a, a reasonably comfortable nice looking uh, scabbard and it, you can then put it on a on a stand and, and display it and take it out and appreciate it and handle it without as much worry. So Shirasaya are, are great ways to, to do things when you're not 100% ready to do a, a full mount and they often make a good companion piece uh, later on. So as an example, one of bling, but how you can store them, this doesn't have an actual blade in it. Uh, you can see that there is a, a bit of buffalo horn. This is the Shirasai for this top sword up here uh, that's made by Fred Chen and it's the lone wolf sword. Uh, but you can get these things made as well. This is called a Shonaizuka, I think is how you pronounce it. It's a wooden sword with a wooden habaki. Uh, you don't always have to get the wooden habaki either, but that lets you, you know, potentially hold your stuff together so that you can leave this out on display. Uh, and you could also put this wooden sword inside, you know, the full mount of stuff up there so that you could have the sword stored in here and the the uh, furniture and in its in an assembled way, you know, sitting on a stand and they could sit next to each other and it makes, makes for a pleasant display. Uh, I have some examples of Nihonto. This is, I believe, a modern Shirasaya. Again, it's got this octagonal shape. This is for, a, you know, an older Wakazashi. Uh, I think the ideal way a Shirasaya looks, from my understanding, what I've been told or read, is that you don't see a lot of character in the wood. You don't see grain. You don't see, uh, you don't see, you know, knots and things like that in the wood. And personally, I like that. I like ca the character of wood. But you know, so seeing seeing this kind of texture may not be considered ideal in Shirasaya. Apparently it's supposed to be uh, kind of very plain, though I could be off. That's that's something I've read, or maybe something I've heard. I don't know that I could even cite my source as to where I've read that, but that's my understanding of what good is, is that you don't see you know, anything. The, the wood is made from Hanoka, which I think is Magnolia, and I'm probably saying the Japanese name wrong, but it's not, you're not, you're supposed to get a piece where you don't see a lot of anything in it. Uh, and getting that type of wood might also be very costly. I could be wrong on that stuff though. Uh, a lot of times I, I don't know exactly if these are magnolia. I don't know what kind of wood it is. I can't really tell. I'm not, I'm not good at identifying them that way. And I don't honestly even know if that's true if you're not supposed to see any knots or anything. But if you have information, you could maybe cite a source or something like that if you happen to know what, what a good Shirasaya looks like. It would be interesting to see it in the commentary below. Uh, this is another kind of wakizashi. Again, you can see, you know, it's quite thick. The thing I would note is that really this is about the same size as the large Shinsakudo katana that I have in there. This is a much smaller katana, um, and it still has a very thick shirasai. Very often the shirasai are quite thick. Uh, and this is an example, I wouldn't even call it shirasai, this is my attempt. Here's my craftsmanship right here of, of Shonaizuga. It's a little bit of foam uh, that I had from from one of my daughter's arts and crafts projects that I stuck in there just so the handle would stay up while I leaned it against the wall. This is actually from a prismic katana and it's in a, it may be a more modern take on Shirasaya. It's an oval shape and I think it's really more meant as a base to start with if you're gonna do, uh, you know, a full mount. But when I mounted the prismic blade, it's the blue one, I think it's this one right here, um, I have to just have new stuff made because I don't know how well this stuff is, you know, how, how deep it's carved out, if, if the mounter is going to have any problems dealing with it or waste time with it. So just opted to have a separate Shirasaya and a separate mount. And that way, you know, whoever buys that thing, if, if anyone does, uh, 
then they have a sure side to go with it or another mount to you know or something to have fun with but that's that's just a, another another option i don't generally see round sure side and i don't know if that's a historic thing or not very often they seem to be this uh, ovoid or not ovoid uh, this octagonal shape versus the oval or ovoid shape and most of the standard oval or standard size shapes that i see in in sure side tend to be uh, modern pieces, modern mass production pieces, though even some mass production companies, like I had a, a Shinto a katana from Hanway in Shirasai, and that was an octagonal shape. Uh, so there are some mass production pieces even that, that will make, at least from Hanway, in a Shirasai that is in a similar format to this. Anyway, that's all I have. The main point to address was that when I was having the Shinsakuno mounted, uh, I had to be kind of cautious. I had to basically think of what's the purpose of this and and work out. I couldn't necessarily get something that both functioned as a sheer asaya and looked presentable uh, while simultaneously being able to be used as a core later on. So kind of weigh that and think about it if you're doing a perspective project. Uh, think about having a sheer asaya done if you have a bare blade laying around. It may be a way to get it into a, into a, a set of clothes that you can at least appreciate the blade more or uh, you know, preserve it from getting moisture or dust or nonsense on it. And uh, lastly, don't assume that somebody that is doing or working with a sheer asaya will be willing or able to use that as a baseline to work from. It's not a guarantee they can't, but just don't make the broad assumption that it works every time. Be sure that you talk with whoever you're working with. And if you're doing the work, be sure you understand that, you know, somebody when they were planning it might have scooped a little deeper and when you sand the the corners down or something there might be a little hole or something that shows up and you'll have to find a creative solution to deal with it anyway that's all the rambling i have for you i hope you found it mildly entertaining or useful and as always cheers and thanks for watching